Get ready, listener, to leave what you knew and to enter a universe of wonder. Close your eyes and open your ears to The Hidden Pages. Sometimes the unreal can become real. Think of that dream you had where you could swear on your very life that all five senses were active. If you had the chance to relive your happiest memory, the one that has started to fade like a black and white photo exposed to too much light, would you? What about that person in your life whom you liked having there, but as the saying goes, was just a season? If you could bring that person back with sorcery or science, would you? And if you did, would you be happy with the outcome? I mean, duh. Who wouldn't, right? Memories are realities. If we remember something in our lives is good, then bringing it back can't be bad. But then again, maybe it could. Because as that other saying goes, the past is history, the present is a gift, and the future? is a mystery. dance in a cold wind as they struggle to hold on to the branches that once gave them life. A headstone etched with the name Lisa Reynolds stands against a flat gray sky. The dates indicate she was alive for only a tender seven years. A pair of black work boots approaches the plot. In these boots stands Desmond Reynolds. He's a bearded man of about 35. His stoic nature gives the impression that he's a man forged by the might of the military. I'm so sorry, my child. His words get blown away by the wind. In a rehearsed fashion, he places the bunch of deep red roses on the ground in front of the headstone. I'll be back to see you again, soon. I promise. On the tombstone is a picture of Lisa encased in glass, eternally a child. Round face, toothy grin, hair tied in a bow. Desmond's fingertips lightly caress the image until he backs away. In the distance, the sun dips below the horizon, setting the sky on fire with explosions of orange and red. Desmond reaches his beat-up, rusted pickup truck and gets inside. His cell phone rests in a cup holder. He picks it up and illuminates the screen. You have one new voice message. First new voice message. Desmond recognizes the voice instantly as Jennifer, his ex-wife. Desmond, this is the third time I've called today. I really wish you would just sign the papers for the lawyer. Or I will fly, drive, or walk back to Kansas and hold the sharpest knife I can find to your dick. Message deleted. He knows her rage well. It's only intensified after their daughter's death. She knows her freedom is at stake. The authorities don't blame her for Lisa's death yet but Desmond does. Next message. Hi, this is messages from Mr. Desmond Reynolds. This is Doug Miller from Intercom Collections. Uh, you have an outstanding balance of $12,492 that we've acquired from Red Oaks Funeral Services, LLC. I am calling to see if we could set up a time and speak and get this debt squared away. I'd hate to have your dead daughter dug up from her grave and taken to the city dump you. Message deleted. You'll get your money, you lowlife. Desmond tosses his phone back into the cup holder and drives away. At an airport terminal, Desmond sits in a row of empty seats. He takes a sip of coffee as he stares through the panel windows at the crews running back and forth on the tarmac as they tend to aircraft arriving and departing. Semper Fi, good buddy. Frank, a stout man in his 50s that appears as if he hasn't bathed in a while, sits next to Desmond. Desmond side-eyes him. Frank points to the Marine's patch on Desmond's jacket. The patch there. You a Marine, or do you steal that jacket? Marine. Retired. Prove it. Desmond shoots him an annoyed look. 
<laughs> I'm just screwing with you. Lighten up, bud. I'm a Marine, too. Made it all the way to Major. Before my knee gave out. Seen some shit, too. Bad shit. Hot in my dreams kind of shit. Tattooed on the back of my eyelids. Screams. Laying on endless loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen some shit, too. I can tell. You got that look in your eyes. Desmond darts his eyes away from the man. Frank pulls out a flask from under his shirt. Shh, don't tell nobody. You don't want to know what it took to get this past them dumb TSA holes. Frank unscrews the top and takes a swig. You want a pool? No thanks, actually. If you don't mind, I'd like to be left alone with all the shit I've seen. Fine, fine. But take it from me. Your thoughts is a dangerous companion. I know. I know. After my son died, I did a lot of that. Nearly drove me mad. You lost a son? Yep. 17 years old. OD'd. Total accident. Millions of kids mess around with drugs and are fine. Mine? Anyway, every year, I try to visit his grave in D.C. I was stationed at Quantico when he passed. I lost a daughter, too. No kidding? Frank takes another pull. Her mom lives in San Diego. She was out for a visit. They went to the beach. Mom got drunk, wasn't paying attention. The lifeguard said if only they had ten more seconds. Anyway. Frank screws the top on the flask and tucks it back under his shirt. I bet yours hurts more. I've never OD'd. But you know what it's like to drown. They still do that, right? In training? Desmond gets up. I'm gonna take a leak. When I get back, I'm gonna sit down, and I hope you're not here. Sorry, pal. I didn't mean anything by it. I'm half in the bag. Like I said, I'd rather be alone with my thoughts. Okay, sure thing. God bless you, bud. Frank struggles to stand. Say, you going to Quantico yourself? No, I'm just a truck driver. Truck driver, hey? What are you taking a plane for? <laughs> Makes no sense. Desmond turns around and grabs Frank. Where are you sitting on the plane? Frank breaks free of Desmond's grasp with surprising ease. In first class, bud. Good. I'm in coach. Don't make eye contact with me when I board. Or what? You gonna beat an old man's ass? I can't afford to miss this flight. I'm doing a job, and I need the money. I'm trying real hard to keep myself in check here, because if I don't, I'm liable to do something real stupid and get 86 out of here, so please, as a brother in arms, leave me the hell alone. All right, you got it, boss. Go take your whiz. I'll go spread my distinct barrel-aged brand of wisdom with someone else who will appreciate it. Go on now, get. Desmond begins to walk away. Frank eyes him until he melds into the crowd. Frank removes a cell phone from his pocket and dials. His demeanor morphs from a drunken fool to a stone-cold soldier. Agent Bluegrass reporting in. The target is triggered, tracked, and primed. On the other end of the phone. Excellent. Upload your vitals via the free fall drop box to confirm your report. Once confirmed, your payment will be deposited. Copy. Frank hangs up the phone. Thanks, Desmond. Frank sighs, then silently toasts and takes a long drink. Desmond boards the plane. The mass of other passengers on either side bump into him as they maneuver to their seats. As Desmond makes his way through first class, he tries to spot Frank so he can avoid him as much as possible. His eyes dart around to all the seats and he relaxes a bit when he doesn't see the old drunk. But that calm doesn't last long. Desmond realizes that if Frank's not in first class, he could have been lying about his section and could be seated next to him. Desmond rubs his temples as he continues on into coach. He spots his seat in the last row and breathes a sigh of relief when he sees that he's got a window seat next to a college-aged couple who look to be either exhausted or hungover. Either way, he knows they'll be quiet. Desmond slinks into his seat, buckles his seatbelt, looks out the window and gets comfortable. As his eyelids get heavy and he begins to drift into dreamland, his instincts begin to nag at him and he begins to wonder why he didn't spot Frank on the plane at all. 
But after just a few minutes, he sinks those thoughts and the plane begins to taxi away from the gate. In a small office in a building on the Quantico campus, Desmond sits at a table with a stack of forms freshly signed with his signature. Regina, a Terminator clad in business casual clothing and about 40 years old, enters holding a briefcase. Did you get all the paperwork signed? Regina grabs the stack and flips through the papers individually to ensure each one is signed. Sorry to have you do this for every haul. It's just how the government wants our company to do it. But I don't need to tell you about the government process, do I? Okay, everything appears to be in order. This transport is a little different than the ones you've done for us before. That's why it pays a lot more than normal. It's nothing we don't think you can handle. It's just this time there will be a security detail all around you for the entire trip. Why is that? The freight you're hauling is very, very valuable. We'll give you the weight and size of the freight when you start your logbook. Although where you're going, we really don't have to worry about being stopped by any local authorities. You'll also have to maintain an average speed of 55 miles per hour and can never, ever go more than 60 miles per hour. What happens if I do? That doesn't concern you, just don't do it. Okay. Regina places the briefcase on the table. She dials in a code to disengage the lock. The code, Desmond can see, is 969. She attempts to open it, but it doesn't open. Open, damn it! She begins to pound on the briefcase. The code is right, 969. Open, you piece of crap! She continues to pound. Cheap-ass American-made piece of sh. The locks pop open. Regina takes a deep breath and calmly opens the briefcase. <sighs> It's been a stressful day. Regina removes a bag of six pills and hands them to Desmond. I'm going to need you to ingest these. What are they? It's a combo of drugs to calm and focus you. Like I said, things are a little bit different this time. I'm not really a pill taker. Yeah, I read that about you. And your file? Your straight edge, not even liquor? That's right. Sorry, kid. Gonna have to have you take them if you want to do the run. Desmond eyes the pile of pills with suspicion. Are you refusing the medication? If so, we can call our reserve driver up in no time. Okay, all right, it's fine. I'll take them. Desmond grabs the bag and chokes down each pill one by one. He can't be sure, but as he swallows, it appears that Regina struggles to restrain a smile. As he puts down the final pill, Regina removes an injection device from the briefcase. All right, one last thing for this phase. I'm going to place a microchip under your skin. Is all of this oversight absolutely necessary? Very. It's all centered around protecting our cargo. Everyone on this mission will be monitored. If our AI's algorithm detects your body is giving off any signals out of the ordinary, zap! The chip will shut you off and the mission will be aborted. Regina grabs Desmond's arm. Shut me off? Permanently? No, we don't have a license to kill. It is pending, though. But it'll give us remote control over your body for a short amount of time to abort the mission. If you can take control of my body, why have me here? Like I said, it's just for a few minutes. When we perfect the tech, we won't need any humans for these missions at all. So collect the cash while you can. Regina swipes a patch of Desmond's skin with an alcohol wipe. She then presses the injector to Desmond's freshly disinfected skin. Oh, almost forgot. Do you give consent to have this tracking chip placed inside of you? Just say yes or no, but say yes. Yes. Regina presses a button to shoot the high-tech chip inside of his body. We'll remove it after the mission. That process isn't as quick, though. Or fun, actually. We need it back because, you see, that little bugger there costs about the same as a diamond twice its size. Regina places all of her belongings into the briefcase. Now, if you'll follow me, we'll conduct mission briefing with the rest of the team down the hall. Desmond hesitates to stand up. At some point, I'll just eject you from the mission and pull in the on-call man if you think you're not up to this. It's just this whole process is so different 
than usual. No, no maps, no directions, no freight manifest. It's different than usual for all of us. High pressure, monumental stakes, and precious cargo. Mr. Reynolds, you were hand-picked for this mission. I would rather have you at the wheel than anyone else. You have an exemplary service record, and your superior officers all praise your calm in stressful situations. So are you ready to get rolling? Yes, ma'am. Good. Then let's get moving. We have to get you suited up and armed. We're providing a Glock 17 as your sidearm, but there will also be an assault rifle in the cab in case shit goes sideways. Which it always can. Regina opens the door. If you're a religious man, Desmond, give us a little prayer. We're gonna need it to transport this equipment without incident. Hmm. Not really my thing anymore. It's dark outside. In a massive parking lot lit by floodlights and surrounded by a mix of bricks, fence, and barbed wire, Desmond climbs up into a cab of a semi that's backed into a loading dock. The semi is flanked on all sides by black, bulletproof SUVs and heavily armed Jeeps. Right before Desmond closes the door, Regina appears and holds the door open. Mr. Reynolds, one last thing. Make sure the volume on the radio in your cab is turned up and do not change the channel. It has been especially tuned to a covert frequency. It'll be your only way to receive instructions from Mission Command. If you lose the channel, you won't know where you're going. Got it? Yes, ma'am. Before Regina closes the door, she takes a long look at Desmond. I hope to see you back here after a successful mission. Regina slams the door closed, and Desmond starts the semi's engine. Welcome aboard, good buddy. Desmond grabs the radio's microphone and pushes the button to talk. It doesn't work. You can't have you being distracted while driving. I'm Marvin, and I'll be the voice of God navigating you to the outer limit. All you have to do is put the pedal to the metal and follow the sound of my voice. Over. What if I don't like the sound of your voice? First, let's get you out of the parking lot. Over. The semi-truck travels down a lone country road. It's surrounded by the security vehicles on all sides. The headlights from the collection of vehicles are the only illumination for miles and miles in any direction. You still with me, Desmond? I'm gonna assume you are, since I have a visual from the drone above you and see you still trucking along. Not much in the way of scenery, huh? If I lived out here, I'd probably shoot myself. Over! I wish you'd do it now. We're gonna continue for about 1,000 more feet and have you take a left over at the fork. Over. Understood. Desmond slows the truck as he prepares to take the sharp turn. He makes the turn, and as he continues down the new road, he notices in his side mirrors that some of the vehicles have not continued with him. Can you confirm the convoy is still with me? Hang with me, Desmond. This is gonna get a bit tricky. There's a lot of turns coming up. Over. Marvin begins to guide Desmond through a maze of roads that twist and turn. As he travels, one by one, vehicles from his convoy continue to drop off. His heartbeat picks up and perspiration begins to build on his forehead. Hell, I think I'm losing them. Hey Desmond, I'm getting a note from Central. We're gonna need you to keep your famous cool. A lot of your vitals are starting to spike. I know where I'm taking you, trust me. It's not the destination I'm worried about. Marvin continues to guide him through turn after turn until the semi reaches a straightaway road. Desmond maneuvers his body to peer out the windows. As far as he can see, every vehicle in his massive security detail has vanished. Once he's sure of his abandonment, he begins to slow the truck to a stop. Desmond, what are you doing? We need you to keep driving, buddy. Command is really freaking out here. Take your foot off the brake, or we abort, and you make nothing. Frustrated and a little bit fearful, Desmond releases the brake and continues to drive down the road. Good choice. We're almost there. Just hang with me. 
Desmond grips the wheel a bit tighter. Now we have to make up some time due to your work stoppage. Hit the gas, but remember to keep it under 60. Desmond's foot squeezes the pedal. He watches the needle on the speedometer climb. 45. 50. 55. Good. We're nearly back on track. Desmond locks his eyes on the speedometer. His focus is so pinpointed that he doesn't notice a dark figure move in front of the truck. Oh crap. What happened? I don't know. I think I hit something. Desmond slows the truck to a stop. He looks out the windows but sees and hears nothing except the chugging engine. Dirt swirls in the headlights. Beyond that, blackness. The radio squawks. You gotta be kidding me. Command is saying you slammed into a deer. I told them not to dismiss your convoy. Over. Must have just skimmed him. He's still got kick. What's that sound? That's him. He's rubbing up against the truck. Christ, we're gonna need you to get out of the cab there and put it out of its misery before it damages the freight. I highly doubt it. Just do it. That scratching is making me sick. Desmond pushes back his jacket and grips his sidearm. With his other hand, he opens the door and gets out. He can now see the full moon lighting the quiet land beyond. On either side of the road is a glut of tall trees. No way anyone could have seen a deer coming. Desmond removes the pistol from its holster as he approaches the dying animal. It's not rubbing against the truck as much as before, but still attempts to stand. Desmond clicks off the safety and hovers his index finger over the trigger. He raises the gun to aim the barrel at the deer's head, but freezes. The deer has stopped moving at the sight of the man. It breathes heavily and locks its eyes with Desmond's. It's strange, but the buck's look seems to plead with Desmond not to kill it. Sorry, old timer. Desmond aims and his fingertip wraps around the trigger. Suddenly the deer writhes again, startling Desmond. He fires repeatedly. Desmond struggles to catch his breath. The gun feels hot in his hand. He checks and sees he's emptied the entire clip into the animal's body. Damn it. I'm losing it. From a distance, Marvin's commands escape from the cab through the open driver's side door. Hey there, killer. Desmond holsters his gun and hustles back to the cab. When he reaches the cab, he climbs in. Jesus, how many rounds did you unload in Bambi there? I thought you had a famous cool. I've got some bad news. Man is calling the mission due to possible damage to the cargo. Sorry, pal. That also means you're not getting paid. What? That wasn't my fault. Shame, too. You were just 1,292 feet from the drop zone. No. I need this money. I did the work. You people can't do this to me. Desmond fires up the engine, shifts into gear, and puts his foot to the gas. Hey, where are you going? Stop! Getting paid. You're not getting paid as it is. Do you want to get thrown in prison too? A bright orange target appears in the middle of the road. All right, all right. Then at least stop the truck in the middle of the target you see in front of you. When Desmond reaches the target, he complies and stops the truck. Desmond, this is Regina. Mission Command is deploying a recovery team to your location. This is a mission failure due to an act of God, I guess. Desmond scoffs at the assessment. I need you to do one more thing before they arrive. The bosses here are pretty anxious about the freight. They want to make sure nothing is damaged. We need you to go to the rear of the truck, open the doors, and inspect the cargo. If everything is okay, give a thumbs up to the sky. The drone will see you. Now, the trailer doors have a keypad lock. Punch in the code 969, and it'll unlock. Desmond doesn't move from his seat. Am I getting paid? Check on the contents, confirm they're secure, and I'll personally see to it that you get paid. Now get moving, Jarhead. Assholes. Desmond pushes the driver's side door open with a bit of fury. He catches himself and notes his swing of emotions. This isn't like him. He doesn't feel like himself. What was in those pills he took? Didn't that Regina lady say they were supposed to neutralize him? He wonders if maybe the drugs are wearing off or kicking in. 
In the distance, Desmond spots the strangest sight. What in the world? Two deer are dragging the blood-soaked body of the buck using their mouths. It appears as if they are trying to take it back into the woods. Desmond rubs his eyes, but the scene still continues. That's not possible. You're... Desmond looks back down the road, but the truck's exterior lights only illuminate so far. The deer should have been long gone in the darkness. The two deer stop and lock eyes with Desmond. Their expressions are somehow accusatory. Without explanation, Desmond waves to them. I did it to end the suffering. The deer go back to their task, and so does Desmond. He walks inches away from the long trailer until he reaches the back. When he gets to the doors, he can't help but be a little bit anxious. He wonders why the contents of this trailer are a complete mystery. Even the most sensitive transports left some unspoken yet understood clue as to what was being hauled. As Desmond approaches the keypad lock, he stops with his finger over the keys and takes a bit of satisfaction that even that smug Marvin probably doesn't know the contents of the trailer. Desmond punches nine. He takes a half step back. Six. He squares up in a defensive pose. Nine. When the lock is fully disengaged, Desmond grabs onto the door's handle and carefully begins to creep open each one of the vertical doors. His face is bathed in white light that emanates from within. It's almost blinding. Desmond pushes open each side of the double doors. As his eyes adjust to the sudden change of light, he's stunned to discover what he's been transporting. At the back of the trailer, Desmond sees his daughter. He can't believe his eyes. Her face wears a sad expression until she notices him at the doors. Daddy? How can this be? She's dead. Or was he lied to? Why? How? These and a million more questions race through his mind, but there's no time. All he knows is that something has gone horribly wrong. He hoists himself up into the trailer and runs toward her. She holds out her arms in anticipation of him picking her up. In one move, he scoops her up and squeezes her tight. She puts her hand on his cheek. He takes her hand to his lips. It's warm. She's real. Daddy. Tears glisten in Desmond's red eyes. How? I thought you... I'm so sorry, baby. I forgive you. Desmond sets her down on the floor. Forgive me? Lisa nods. What happened to me really happened. Desmond's eyes begin to search her expression. What do you mean? I went up. Lisa points up. Desmond looks at her. <sighs> uh, up? You mean... Lisa nods again, smiling this time. Yes! I was there! It's real! Desmond's mouth slowly drops. His searching eyes freeze. It is? It, it's... it's a real... place? Yes! What's it like? It's warm there all the time. Quiet, too. Everyone is happy. Nothing hurts ever. Do you remember that Christmas when you were far away? You were in the tent on the computer and told Mommy to take me to the garage? Yeah, I do. Then when we went out there, there was a big dollhouse. You told me you gave Santa orders to drop deliver it to me from you. I should have been there to give it to you myself. Then Tito was so excited that I was excited he peed on the floor. Mommy got mad. But I was happy. It was the best Christmas ever. That's what it's like there. It's like my favorite memory all the time. That sounds... They sent me back, though. They said you needed me. Who said that? The one who 
ones who brought me here. How? How, how did they bring you back? Lisa gestures behind Desmond. He looks over his shoulder. Attached to the sidewall of the trailer, there's a long, nondescript metal container about the size of a large coffin. Desmond looks back at Lisa. What is that? What's in there? Lisa cocks her head as if she is listening for instructions. They're telling me there's not much time left. I have to go soon. Desmond takes a second to process this information. His shaking hands caress her shoulders. No, 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 don't leave me again. I have to. I don't belong here. I just came to say don't cry anymore. I see you when you cry and it makes me sad. I'm so sorry. I, I, sh I should have been there. I shouldn't have let you go. I should have protected you. I forgive you, Daddy. Desmond holds Lisa tighter now. Don't go! Please, for the love of- But Desmond stops himself. The long face returns again. I have to. Be nice, Daddy. And I'll see you there, too. No, no! We, we, can, we can get out of here. We can go home! Desmond runs toward the trailer's doors to go outside. We can go home! Nothing is taking you from me again. I love you. As Desmond jumps out of the trailer, Lisa begins to disappear out of his death grip. Her body turns into nothing but air. As his feet hit the pavement, he finds his hands clutching his own chest. Lisa. Desmond finally breaks and begins to sob uncontrollably. Come back. Desmond collects himself and looks back into the trailer. In the distance, over the helicopter noise, he swears that he can hear Marvin's voice screaming from the cab. It all sounds like a distant movie as he climbs back into the trailer. Lisa! Lisa, come back! Bring her back, you bastards! He approaches the metal coffin attached to the side of the trailer and begins to punch it until his fist bleeds. What did you do with her? I need her! The box is unscathed. He uses his good hand to remove the pistol from his waist. He points it at the box. Bring her back, or... With both of his hands shaking, he releases the clip. To his surprise, it still holds a single bullet. The moment of shock quickly passes to acceptance. If you can't be with me, then I'll be with you. Baby girl. Without hesitation, he pulls back the hammer and puts the gun to his temple. In the middle of the road, a Black Hawk helicopter lands nearby the semi-truck. A pair of soldiers geared up to take on anything from Godzilla to King Kong hop out and begin to set up a perimeter. One soldier speaks into his transmitter. All clear, ma'am. Regina pushes past the armed men to make her way toward the semi's trailer. Stepping off the helicopter with far less grace is Dr. Peter Kwan. He's about 50 years old and wears a white lab coat over his solid black suit. Proceed with caution, Regina. I don't want you to damage any components in there. Dr. Kwan struggles to catch up to Regina. Inside the trailer, Regina and Dr. Kwan look at the spasming body of Desmond on the trailer's floor. Please, Lisa. Siren. Oh, oh shit. Altamira. Sisipa. Sisipa. Damn you, Desmond. If there is a hell, damn you. I really thought you had what it took to see through the charade. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you that I told you so. This technology is just too powerful. Regina holds the tablet over Desmond's wrist where the microchip was implanted. The tablet's screen begins to download information from the chip wirelessly. You can't build a realistic simulation environment with this level of AI and not expect these kinds of consequences. I mean, it even recreated the bullet for him to kill himself for crying out loud. 
Not to mention the addition of chemical cocktail you made him ingest. And I won't even expound upon my concerns about what they made us do to his ex-wife. Regina hands Dr. Kwan the tablet. It's finished ingesting his vitals. Dr. Kwan eyes the tablet to read over the data. Just as I theorized, it appears as if the reconstruction of his daughter was so lifelike and her story of an afterlife was so convincing that he actually believed it. Believed it all. These numbers are unreal. Great. I wanted this to fail, you know. Now the bosses are going to want to put this god box into the field. Can you imagine? Interrogation without physical torture? Battles where enemies kill themselves for you? This is too much power. Maybe we can delay our report and blame the machine's success on the deer's unexpected interference. I knew we should have called the mission there. I thought for sure he would realize this was all fake. Regina crouches down next to Desmond's convulsing body. She reaches out and pushes back both of his eyelids. Desmond's pupils are rolled back into his head. Now he's brain fried. At least for now. But he'll come around and we'll have another mess on our hands. Well, I'll be at your disposal to back up your analysis with any data I can. Regina pulls out a cell phone from her pocket and dials. Shut down the satellites, please. I don't want this machine wigging out when the rest of the team arrives. Dr. Kwan eyes Desmond and hustles to catch up to Regina. I gotta get to sleep. I'll be on the phone all morning with the VPs. I'm gonna try to convince them to give me resources to run this mission again. Do you have another subject? I always have a backup, Doctor. What about the cleanup back at headquarters? You can handle that, can't you? I hate that part. Well, I hate the part where I have to invest three months in a test subject, sending him on a fake mission just to have him turn into a babbling mess on the floor. Dr. Kwan enters a cement room, a single light hanging from the ceiling. In the middle of the room is a blonde woman about 30 years old. She's seated and strapped to a very uncomfortable looking chair. She's geared up in a VR experience and has a thousand wires jetting out from various points of her body. Tito, no. You little monster. I'm gonna kill you. Dr. Kwan approaches with trepidation. Jennifer? No, I'm not really gonna kill him, baby girl. Tell your daddy thank you for the dollhouse. Dr. Kwan removes the VR unit's visor to reveal a pair of eyes that look like they've been crying for an eternity. The whites of the eyeballs look permanently pink. The bags under her eyes are a mix of dark blue and purple. Huh? Dr. Kwan removes the visor more to reveal the face of Desmond's ex-wife, Jennifer. Mrs. Reynolds. The VR experience is a home video loop of the Christmas morning Lisa described to Desmond in the trailer. Dr. Kwan gingerly plucks off the headphones on Jennifer's head. Please, no more. I can't. No more. Finally, Jennifer notices the familiar face. The experiment is done. We appreciate the use of your memories. Can I go home now? Unfortunately, the mission was a failure. It seems the memories we had you beam into the machine were too... intense. The authorities are outside, waiting to take you back to San Diego. But... Oh well. That's life. I'm sure you'll feel differently about the situation later. It seems to me like Desmond and Jennifer are now a match made in heaven. Ha! A couple of brain-fried nobodies who fell victim to a type of machine beyond their control. Now, ask yourself, dear listener, how much of your reality do you give up? How much of your life is spent in an environment that you did not create? How do you suspect these environments influence your own mind? Of course, I could just be paranoid. After all, I do wear a colander over my head when I'm outside and only talk on the phone when I'm taking showers. Or maybe, just maybe, they're all getting inside your heads too. 
Until next time on The Hidden Pages. No, 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 no. Oh, wait, that's the music cue. Hidden Pages was created by Sammy Sarzoza and Aaron Gould, who hold the copyright. This episode of The Hidden Pages is titled The God Box and was written and produced by Sammy Sarzoza and Aaron Gould. The narrator and collection agency representative were performed by Eric Pierce. Desmond was performed by Andy Gates. Regina and Lisa were performed by Kate Huffman. Jennifer was performed by Mary Taylor. And Frank and Marvin were performed by Jean Augusto. Sound design and mixing were completed by Andrew Mock of the AM production. Artwork was provided by Yoga Adityana. Podcast and distribution services were provided by Ryan Garza of Podletter Media. Assistant editing was provided by Ben Kurzrock. This episode was recorded at MVP Music in Los Angeles, California. To listen to more and learn about upcoming episodes, visit thehiddenpages.net. Semper Fi, goodbye.